Well, this talk is about LLVM. Uh, we are going to cover uh, two tools that we, we have developed. Uh, one is by Daniel and the other one is by me. At the end of the, of the call, you can see my teacher. No, see like that? <laughs> okay, that's the father of the tool. So, uh, first of all, uh, we would like to know uh, what your current level uh, with programming and LLVM and cheats. So, uh, I'm going to make a few questions, and if it's yes, uh, please uh, raise your hand. Okay? So, uh, do you know about the LLVM? Okay. Have you programmed something with it? Much better. <laughs> and do you know SO, SO programming or assembly? Okay. Well, and finally, do you know about cheats? Just in time compilation. Have you ever done yeah. something with that? Okay. No. You know it, but <coughs> you have um, used okay. 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 Perfect. Mm -hmm. So that's all for it. Let's learn Studio Line, as I said, that's previously in the context of LLVM. Then a bit of uh, its uh, IR, which is the, the key of the kernel. Then a uh, nice part about the the tool which is called Darello, which is dynamic instrumentation, and then will come uh, Danny with uh, it's just in time. Uh, if in, in any moment you want to stop me, ask something, just go ahead, okay? Um, no worries. <coughs> so, um, let's go to the photo because I have to look there and there. <laughs> I have to double myself. So, uh, the point about LLVM is that. Uh, it surpassed a monolithic, um, highly hierarchical design, and it went in favor of a modular design, which could be reused, um, implemented from, by different people, and proved. And also uh, the lessons, which is kind of free. I guess uh, that you know much more about, about that than, than I do, because I'm not into free stuff. And, uh, well, it's, it's quite fast. So that's quite a good point for it. Uh, these are some of the projects that are currently using it. Uh, this okay. is this, uh, obviously not exhaustive because <laughs> there are plenty of them. Uh, as my friend would like uh, much to point out, um, the, uh, what is it? Um, is that something about the PlayStation, right? Oh, let's see here. Okay. Well, um, free, the free BSA toolchain is used on uh, PlayStation. Uh, okay, so that's the basic tool chain of uh, LLVM. So basically what they do is uh, they decouple the three steps of, uh, of a classical compiler. I'm going to just keep this because most of you are, you know, LLVM. So uh, some graphics of comparison of performance between the different versions of this in LLVM. They are quite on par, mostly, but uh, LLVM is improving faster while GCC has its uh, problem to, to be uh, And well, well, that's the first, the, the big question, no? so what can you do with LLVM? Because at, at the end, that's uh, what matters to you. So uh, if you remember from, from the previous um, modular decomposition, you can either produce uh, IR from, from another language, from, from a language that you would implement yourself or that you invent. These are the steps that you would uh, follow. On the middle, you have optimization analysis. Mostly you would do uh, optimization passes because uh, analysis are, well, they just produce information for other passes to, to consume. So uh, unless you are really into LLVM development, you would only do uh, optimization passes. And also, uh, if you wanted to, I don't know, implement a new processor, which you could do, uh, well, you could somehow easily do it. Indeed, it's the, the most difficult part, so I recommend you not to go there. <laughs> yeah. um, how to install it? So uh, I'm not going to cover that because on um, its web page, it's already, uh, there's already a very good uh, introduction, and detailed explanation of how to do it. Uh, you will need easily two hours, um, yeah, 20 gigabytes of uh, space. 
Uh, do not compile in the back mode because well, you don't really need it unless you are going to the back uh, pass itself. So, uh, um, going back to the, the tool, tool chain that uh, was composed into three steps. Uh, what does it do in the, in the first step? So basically, it produces the AST from, from the language, uh, which then uh, represents into IR. Uh, I guess, you know, how does it work? It's mostly an intermediate representation, which is similar to assembly, uh, with simple instructions and um, high-level data types. That's, uh, that's a key component. And well, as I said, if you really don't, don't know what to do with your life, you can try to do uh, a new language. I wouldn't do it. Uh, sorry, uh, I think I missed one. Yeah, yeah, I missed one. Okay, so um, producing machine code from, from IR, it's quite simple. Um, basically, translating a series or one instruction to Known or many instructions of uh, assembly. Um, well, don't don't it either. These are some of the optimization passes that are available that you can um, play with. You can apply one one after the other if you want to. Uh, some of the keys of the higher, as I said before, it's a strongly typed. It also has, well, it's said to have infinite virtual registers, but that's not really true. I mean, uh, the registers are virtual, they do not exist. So you cannot get the address or directly access them. They are just mostly a representation of the, of the instruction itself. We would like to see uh, an example. There's also explicit array and structural indexing, as well as user data types. Uh, it's easy to, to get some source code and go to IR and then you can inspect it yourself and, and see how does it work. And uh, well, finally, uh, it's, it uses SSA, uh, which is a static single assignment, uh, meaning that uh, each variable is uh, written or defined only once. But it can be read many times. That makes it uh, quite easy, so to say, uh, fast to implement um, Difficult optimizations that would otherwise require more time. So, uh, sorry, should yeah. you say the variable is never changed? Uh, the virtual register. Okay. Yeah, it's uh, just created create once in this uh, intermediate representation mm -hmm. and can be read many times. Okay. If you need to, you would copy it to, an, to a new one, so you would have uh, plenty of them. Uh, That. Yeah, that's also a problem if you get to think about it because we are just defining a variable once. So, for instance, let's say that, I, that we have a very basic code with, a, with an if and a, an else. Okay? Mm -hmm. So you said a to 2 and then a to 3. Mm -hmm. And these uh, nodes converge. But the variable has uh, two values depending on the block that it's coming from. In that case, it's represented with a 5 node. It's basically, it's, uh, well, it allows. Uh, the different paths mm -hmm. to uh, merge into the in this final value. Okay. So it's a kind of a hack between um, on the basic definition because otherwise uh, they cannot represent uh, mm -hmm. all the sides. Okay. So that's uh, an example of how to compile bytecode as well as link it. And then, uh, well, if you've got. Yeah. Sorry, I have another example. Okay. <laughs> I'll do that. You should read my slides. <laughs> So uh, if you have uh, your source code, you can uh, generate the bytecode, inspect it, and run a bit from it. Uh, I'll show you some, uh, some examples as well. And you can apply uh, an impasse, uh, which is already provided, or you can employ your own. Uh, by default, uh, LLVM uh, does only offer uh, OPT as, uh, as the program that can apply uh, an impasse to, to bytecode. Otherwise, uh, you will select you have to modify the line itself. So, uh, an example, on this example, like, that, like, like this one, which is just uh, two variables within sum. So, for hold that's the loading from the direction, okay? That's the direction of A. That's the say type, and it's written. Alignment, obviously. As you can see, there are, it defines new variables for each of them. Then, uh, sums it together, and it stores, stores it on a virtual register. 
That's the one I told you that it's not real because you'll never access it. Indeed, this one is only representing this uh, instruction itself. And finally, the, the store to the memory location. As uh, a curiosity, let's see an example of a, of a simple loop. Let's see initialization. Uh, let's see uh, comparison of the condition, the loop itself, and the increasing of the, of the iterator. Uh, you, you do have a, a bus that um, outputs the source code to, to graph, to a graph, if you want to, to visualize it. So, uh, any questions so far? Pretty much covers the introduction, even though uh, my friend will uh, explain some other basic uh, LLVM concepts for, for this part. I have a question. Yeah. So, that uh, bytecode, yeah. uh, is it like stable? Does it change over time? Like there's new uh, functions added, or is it no, always it's, the it's same? stable. It's, yeah. it's the same. <laughs> if you work on just in time, then you will have to change stuff over time. No, but, but he's talking about the definition of the language. Yeah, by so definition, it shouldn't change. Not, not the definition is changing, in fact. For example, I think the latest versions are, are stripping the splicey types in uh -huh. pointer operations to have uh, naked pointers, because it makes easier some optimization. So it's not that stable. Yeah, it's not like <laughs> it's not uh, written in stone. Yeah. Is yeah. What's, what is not stable is the code itself of the uh, yeah. Easily, you can see that you are using some functions, and then they disappear completely okay. on the base of the code. So that's something <laughs> they, yeah, they tell you in advance. Mm, I'm in favor of that because they, that, that allows them to have a better uh, API. Yeah. Any other questions? No. Okay. So um, I'm going to talk about Tarello, which is a program that was developed at ESC. Uh, <laughs> it, it comes from a lineage of uh, programs with uh, curious names such as Paraver and Dimemas and well, all our in-house jokes which are not funny. And then uh, we have Toreador which, uh, well, uh, it's called like that because of the mix between Toreador, obviously, and the fact that it's uh, looking to find different tasks within a program. So uh, we mostly used it as a tool to to teach uh, parallelism to, to undergraduate levels. And uh, well, what you mostly do is uh, to dynamically instrument. Well, it does more than that, but that's the segment that we'll cover. Okay, so let's see, let's see workflow. So basically, we take a, a sequential program because we are looking for how to parallelize it, but we we do not start with a parallel program, then um, compile it with LLVM, add whatever we need, that we will see later, produce an executable, um, run it, and then uh, we have a enormous block, which is gigabytes, of all the accesses and functions and loops and whatever, and then um, we sort that out, and we have something like this. That's what we use for teaching. So basically, these are different instances of these uh, two nested loops, and that's another loop. And the lines connect uh, the, this task depending on, on their dependencies, okay? So mm -hmm. any of those that are in the same line could be executed in parallel, okay? So uh, the point is, that uh, we have all the information of the data accesses for a given execution with a given set of parameters, that's obviously. And um, we provide, we suggest different um, parallelizations to, to this code based on its dependencies and the amount of uh, parallelism that can be achieved. So, uh, what how did we how did we use uh, LVM for that? First of all, um, we don't want to use OPT to to apply our pass because that would mean that if you have a project with a ten source files, you would have to apply it ten times, which is not practical, especially if you are if you need to have uh, rigorous testing on your system. So what we did instead is to uh, extend CLang itself and add automatically overpass to any compilation unit. 
And uh, also, should, when linking, we link against the against our um, against our own runtime system. Also, we need to include um, the bug information because we do go tracking, meaning that we, we want to know where each function or variable comes from, from from the source code. Because, well, the previous image, um, that's an interface that we have where you can. Um, uh, click over the notes and see which data is being used by the note itself or which data is uh, a dependence from the previous or next notes. Also, we have an overview with different parallelization strategies depending on um, if, we, if we choose to nest or to break a, a task into many other tasks. So, uh, we provide a way to have a clear visual representation of the, of the program itself. Okay, and that's that's why uh, we need uh, the back information, even though it's uh, slow. We won't cover the runtime. So what, what we do in the in the population path, first of all, we, we generate the IDs for, for each of the function loop variables. That does include uh, information. Also, we count the uh, instructions because uh, we want um, deterministic results. So, uh, if we were to measure time, that would change our execution. On the other hand, what we do is that uh, it's basic block. Uh, do you all know what, what a basic block is? Yeah? Okay, so some of you don't. Uh, basically, uh, a basic block is uh, the consecution of uh, instructions where there's a single entry point and just uh, one exiting point. So, yeah, the, the last instruction is always a jump to any other position. You can, you want to show the, the graph? Yeah. Mm -hmm. code. Yeah, so mm -hmm. like in that case, yeah, these are the basic blocks and see that the last instruction is always a branch in that case, okay? So it could be without uh, any condition like this one or with a condition. As you can see, it's uh, some, some those uh, jumps uh, won't translate to any assembly instructions because they are just uh, connecting uh, the basic blocks, but they are not needed in the ex in the real execution. Well, it depends on how you compile that loop. But probably they won't be there. So, yeah. So, um, begin that the basic block is the basic unit of execution. I mean, if you get to execute the first instruction, you are going to execute all of them, and only all of them once. If you want to count the amount of instructions that have been executed in the whole program, you just have to add uh, the counting for each basic block. You could do it for instruction, but that would be much slower. And you cannot do better than that. And uh, well, it's just a call to the runtime. And also, um, we inject calls to identify uh, all the memory accesses, all the object creation and instructions, because whenever we have an access, we'll wait to, to resolve it until runtime, because you know you cannot always uh, resolve the aliases in the compilation. And then whenever we have the final pointer, we consume the data of all the objects that were created, and uh, we uh, just uh, save in our log. So access to the to the matrix A in line blah 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 uh, of um, I don't know eight bits, eight bytes. Excuse me. Uh, okay. So yeah. As well. Uh, we need to know where to move uh, functions and iterations to start because later on when we are traversing the different uh, possible parallelizations, uh, we need to break those sections into subsections. So we need to have, we need to know the, the start and, end, and ending of those uh, higher level constructs. And, well, I can mostly, yeah, I'm gonna skip that. So just like a, as a curiosity, this is the this part of the source code, and that's the that's the module pass, which well, whenever you're doing an optimization pass, you can do it over a, a, a module, a function, or yeah, that's it. Yeah. 
And well, we had to implement it over module because we need uh, access to all the functions we have in, in the module. Uh, more or less, a module uh, maps to a compilation unit. Okay. And well, that's just a curiosity. And then that's uh, how do you traverse a, a loop in case uh, you are interested. Uh, you first get the iterator for basic blocks within the function, and then here you go over them. Yeah, it's quite easy. I mean, the iterator, so it's no, no big deal. Okay, so I, my I have a question. Yep, sure. I've done very small things, not about mm -hmm. your thing, your project. I've done very small things on the on LLVM, mm -hmm. and I find the documentation not very good. Yes. Is it me that don't know where to look, or is it that it's not very good? Because like sometimes it's like I have a pointer, and it has like yeah. I want to look like do the iteration you want to do. Mm -hmm. right? Like I need to go and like basically call all the functions and print everything and until I find something that yeah, that's does kind of what I want. Yeah, the documentation of LLVM is good, is very good, but only on the initial steps. I mean, to do the very basic stuff, very, very basic stuff. From that point on, you find nothing. I mean, you have to get to read code. You have to read other people's passes. Yeah, that's tools. what I do at the end, I copy and paste. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but... I mean, it's, that's programming, right? But yeah. <laughs> yeah, but we all started like that, right? I mean, you start copying other people, at the end you start copying yourself. So. No big deal. Any other question? No? Okay. Right. So, Lani, you go. My turn. Okay. So, um, I'm going to try to explain how to, how to write a just a time compiler. Uh, this is a project that I did for, for a Google Summer of Code thing for FreeBSD. <coughs> and in my case, which will depend on the personal project, it was basically for, uh, in order to speed up the firewalling process with IPFW, which is the previous this firewall. And basically we were using NetMap, which is a research thing where you have user space access to the, to the network interface cards. So basically you have to, you basically do DMA uh, to, the, to the network card and get information from there. And that's very fast. I don't want to bore you with detail, but that's, that's what I just explained. Um, uh, so if you have any questions, as before, just interrupt me. Um, so basically, interpretation and compilation are the, 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 the stuff that we were doing for, for our firewall, um, firewalling process. And we basically try through instructions, we evaluate them, and finally we execute stuff depending on, on instruction. This is supposedly slow, and, and in our case, basically it involves um, two nested for loops with a giant switch, depending on the on the on our rule. Uh, so basically, the ways that we can accelerate this kind of interpretation is just in time compilation, which means compile the stuff that you have to do and then execute it on at runtime or ahead of time compilation, which might be uh, off the runtime. So depending on the kind of optimizations that you want to do, uh, you won't be able to, to do that with ahead of time compilation. And then if we consider virtual machines a kind of uh, interpreters, then we have things like architectures depending stuff like uh, technologies for to in order to, to enhance the, the virtualization process. Uh, so basically we want to, to do this kind of stuff. We need to generate code, uh, compile it if it is not binary, and, uh, and that's it. Uh, so in our case, uh, I'm going to repeat some of the, of the stuff that Arturo said before. But um, we're going to I'm going to present the, the objects, the basic objects that we are going to need in order to represent data, uh, represent uh, the, the compilation process, and that kind of stuff. So basically, we have the value type, value object the type object and the struct type and pointer type. And basically the way to do it is we have a, an internal representation builder which will do all the stuff. I will present it afterwards. And basically we create an allocation instruction in, in the LLVMs IR. And then we will store a value there, which will be of type uh, in 32 type. And for the other stuff, we basically create this one 
basic types like for for eight, eight bits uh, or for characters, we can just get them from from the definition. And if we need to do some other stuff, we have to to create pointers to a type. We can use this function uh, from the pointer type get and call five pointer. Um, so yeah, this is the thing that he explained before. We have a module which represents a compilation unit and it holds <coughs> metadata, functions, and some structure definitions and like. So basically, we have a function which contains basic blocks, which, as he explained, uh, basic blocks are the way that we can implement conditionals and we can jump from one place to another. And each basic block will contain more instructions. Um, so in this case, uh, in order to generate code, we have the IR builder and the context. The context is basically the, an object that contains all the information about what is the compiler doing right now. And, and the IR builder is basically the object uh, with which we can generate all the code. And yeah, this is another example, as, as I said. We have to set the insert point into a basic block, and of type basic block, and then we just create the instructions. Uh, so in, our, in my case, uh, what, what I did was uh, defining all the stuff that we're going to need and compile it in a, in a bit code file, which it will be a bit binary with, with metadata in order to get all the stuff. And we basically perform the iteration, which is a, an interpretation in order to add the code that we need. And we have to be careful with the rules that might change our control flow. And, and you just can't, can't use some function like yeah so some functions and definitions might be optimized away and deleted if we are not going to use them so we'll take care about that later so finally we just compile it and we can perform stuff like static analysis with our, uh, our generated <coughs> code or runtime optimizations like feedback driven optimizations which is one of the things that I want to do hopefully and basically is analyze the the kind of of traffic that we have in order to optimize the order in which the rules are, are evaluated. And that way we can get a even faster firewall. Um, oh. <laughs> oh. Okay, so this is the how we can get to, to compile it. And basically we start with a, initializing what is called a native target, which will set up all the stuff that we need in order to perform the actual compilation in order to uh, get information from the architecture to optimize that stuff. Uh, we have to link in the just-in-time compiler into the LLVM's runtime. And then we have to create what is called a pass manager builder, which will basically, uh, it, we, we will, it will be used to pass all the optimizations that we need. And can you read that? No, right? Okay, no. okay. I'm going to try to explain that. Um, so basically, <laughs> Uh, yeah, and then, oh, one second. Okay. So, yeah, with the function pass manager, we will just perform all the all the passes to optimize our bit code, uh, the the final bit code, and then we will delete some of the functions that I have defined in order to keep all the all the structures definition. And, and at the end, we will just create what is called an engine builder, which will create the engine, the execution engine, which will actually perform the the, the compilation when we call some function like the one here, which is get pointer to function, which will then uh, compile it. This will be executed like in, in runtime. And uh, I mean, how is the process? It's like uh, the. Hold on a second. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, well, I'll ask first. The, I mean, it will be like uh, the code, uh, the code in high level language is uh, executed and then compiled at the same time every basic unit. No, what we do is uh, we iterate through all the rule set. Uh -huh. And then we, have, we know that at uh, the start of each evaluation, we have to do some stuff. So this stuff is defined in a function. And then what you do is you get the, a pointer to this function, and you basically insert a call to that. But I'm going to go on that 
Okay, okay. Right. So please ask then if you don't understand it, yeah. which might happen. Um, so basically what we do is we have all these functions defined on, on bitcode and they are in order to ensure that if we are not using the just in time it will it will it won't lose performance we basically inline them and that way we just uh, avoid uh, some some performance problems with that and what is the example you might read the do you read this now yeah okay so basically what we do is we ensure to to avoid optimizations because if we have any optimization um, in to a function which doesn't that doesn't do anything it's dead code basically so this dead code uh, does stuff with some definitions that we need in the in the runtime. If we optimize it away, it will clean it and, and there won't be anything. Um, so basically what we have is a function what is called IPFW, <coughs> which has a function prolog, which does initialization, allocation, that kind of stuff. And then we access to all the rules and perform a, some kind of prolog and uh, each rule is defined is divided in, in commands which will be further divided in, in micro commands or in commands and so all of this is defined as a basic block and we do some we might do some some kind of checking of some variables and stuff but since we have a, ba a basic block it will it will perform um, conditions and like that linearly in a linear fashion and so we can just um, get a basic block and add it to the to, to what we have defined so far. So in this case, um, we have a, a number of rules, whatever it is, and we start with the rule prolog, and then we add uh, the, the other prolog for the command and the stuff that it does. A rule might have many many commands, and then we basically jump to the next uh, rule if we are not done yet. Um, Questions with this because we'll probably not understand. This. And so you you, um, <laughs> you you start uh, you start with the first instruction instruction and then you go to the next one until you reach the end of this uh, section. More like yes. Um, but but this is parameterized but uh, all the possible inputs right? It's like you take this with this input this run will run like this right? Yes. And you save this compilation. Mm -hmm. For later, yes. And so now we basically jump there when we need it. Uh, at right now. Okay. Does it make sense. Like you, you execute the code, and then the so processor gets. In what we do is, is um, we say we need to check the traffic. Then when we need it, then we iterate through the whole rule set, uh -huh. and then we will create the function that we need that will that will be executed in a linear way. Okay. Yeah. We basically here just jump to the next rule and, and keep going. And in our case, we just add here, it is really added a, a, a jump to our basic blocks, which would be the, the prolog, the epilog, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Does it make sense now? Yeah, and the, if, the, if the input uh, packet is different? We don't uh, care about that. Uh, if, the, if the input packet is, this is independent. So we basically check the rules, and then for each rule, we check well, at start here, we we actually set a, a number of variables to define how the packet is. Okay. And then we will uh, execute all of these, and with these conditions, this will happen. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So it's the, it's dependent of the conditions of the of the packet, let's say. Yes. And yeah. and if then another packet that is the, the fulfills the same conditions, then, then you avoid the computation of. of yes. This. We avoid the interpretation of that. The interpretation, right? Uh, okay, okay, yeah. Uh, well, I, I was wondering if, if you can do that. Uh, you can do that in parallel, like in many threads. Technically, yes. Like different packets can be done in parallel, for example. You don't need to do that. I mean, uh, you compile the stuff, mm -hmm. and then let's say that you have uh, a number of cores mm -hmm. in the in the network card, which is which be, well, <laughs> on the network card, or doesn't matter. And then we can, if if we can, which will involve a lot of locking and and stuff, because. Um, then we could send a packet to a, to a core, which will execute uh, this, mm -hmm. basically. Yeah, of course, because you, you said before, or, or your, your mate, that uh, there was a global context mm -hmm. from LLVM. Uh, so this global context, uh, how do you, if, you, if you are with many threads, many threads have to write concurrently to the same context. And, and, and on top of that, the, the firewall actually 
it, it blocks. There's a mutex for the for the traffic. So. Okay. Yeah. And everything is in user space in this case. Yes. There is in no. In this case, it is. So I didn't get. Oh, I didn't get any any kernel exception or anything. No, okay. Yeah, yeah. Is that clear? Yeah. Okay. Um. So yeah, the the way the way I did this was basically uh, for each of the conditions here in a switch. We have a case and then do something, which might be more or less long. And what I did was put it into functions, which will be in line. And then the other thing we have to do is uh, emit uh, emit a call to the to this function. So this is uh, an LVM. We are creating here an instruction with LVM. So basically, if we if we have a condition, then we would create a call to that with the parameters. And in some cases, it will it will be very ugly because I have I have functions like with 17 parameters. So that's, that's not cute. Um, and that's it. So in the case in the case where in the case where we are only interpreting the the rule set, then we will basically call uh, this function. If we are actually compiling, then we will emit a call to that. And in this case, well, when I when I I got it working for the first time, I couldn't believe it. I had a, a seven speed up, it was seven times faster, and and apparently it's normal. That's the you know the standard numbers for for just in time compilation. And it might be even faster with feedback driven optimizations and something like that. And furthermore, the more rules we have, the better the speed up will be because we are wasting less time on the actual interpretation. And I think that's uh, okay. okay. So that's in the end, I'm supposed to sell it, right? <laughs> and I guess you have a lot of background, so I don't need to go into this. But what I want to say is that so LLVM is a complete compiler, and, and but we originally are from a research institution, and people there are writing papers, so that's taking care of business, and nobody wants to go into compiler. And originally, we were doing something with with Tarado tool, which was uh, with Walgreen, with binary translation. And we wanted to go into an LVM to see if we can get more information, if we can get more information by, by merging dynamic information and static information. So you can easily try it and take LLVM and, and count instructions or, or do something that's going to be very cheap and, and, and very easy to do. But as you go further, you're going to see how more things you can do. And, and, and that's still, you're still learning and you're more than two years. So, yeah. Okay. So, comparing to GCC, well, a lot of people are afraid of GCC because GCC is not modular. You cannot take a very small pass and, and, and do something something very simple. So, so it's people get overwhelmed with, with complexity. So, so it's. I would say that the documentation was easy for us to start with something, and then as we go and as we progress, especially in this mixing static and dynamic instrumentation, then you have to read the code and see what you can do. So it's open source and, and the industry is increasingly using it. So, and why, how come we are here today? So Alej saw that uh, there's a conference or a workshop, I think conference, uh, called Euro LLVM 2016. So they are making two conferences per year, one in States, one in, in Europe. And this year it's in mid-March in, in Barcelona, in Hotel Princesa Sofia. And actually the whole week is full of conferences, so the first three days are uh, CGO, which is Code Generation and Optimization, HPCA, which is High Performance Computer Architecture, and PPOPP, which is again about something about parallel programming. So these are quite, quite major conferences in, in the field. And the last two days, Thursday and Friday, 17th and 18th, is uh, Euro LLVM and CC, which is Compiler Construction, uh, right? workshop so for uh, compiler workshop is going to be two small rooms like 50 people and for euro LVM is going to be two rooms with 200 and 100 people and also what they do is they it's a development developments and developers meeting so they have two rooms for, for collaboration there I so I think now the, the early registration pass so now it's 200 200 euros per for these two days and and compared to other conferences that we usually attend this is quite quite industry 
paced and, and, and made for industry and that's especially because industry as I said is increasingly using more and more uh, LLVM so Apple well they bought the guy who, who invented LLVM and they are basing more or less everything on iOS on LLVM also Sony and uh, PS4 console uh, and ARM for, for the new architecture and you can see which were the, the sponsors the last year so these people are there so if you want to uh, do networking or how do they call it or, or, or see actual presentation so I guess the most papers would be it's going to be half and half half from the industry half from the academics with this uh, collocation with CC they're planning to make uh, a joint session of one day, so there's going to be some mixture of, of everything. And and these are the references if you want to, but you can just go to the website and it's not pretty, but it has all the information and all the, all the links of LLVM. And yeah, technical questions on them, and <laughs> I'm still selling it if you have anything. So, have you tried GC before? Was it very bad, or do you think that they didn't get well, I, I don't know anybody who tried dealing with GCC. <laughs> <laughs> so do you? Does anybody know anybody? Because I think people are very, very afraid of that. And, and yes, the, this thing where, where, where we said we, with this tool, we said we need to count instructions, we need to we need to intercept every load and store and, and these things we can do in, in a couple of days and then it was just uh, <laughs> no <laughs> it took me three months to get started and oh, then I'm yeah <laughs> <nice advice>. <laughs> <laughs> i'm selling you <laughs> yeah but we don't need to lie and <laughs> no, we were counting instructions in a couple of days yeah after Are three you? months of looking around and getting used to it <laughs> so that's it's problem hard. i think you need a lot of time to start with it, basically a few months. But then after that, it's easier. Still, uh, you need to know about compilers, about architecture, about manual things, so be careful. Yeah, but the point is, in, in what we do, the, the compiler is like a holy grail. Whatever you want to do, you can do it in a compiler, and then you write that in a paper, but a compiler can do that. You do everything else, and you write in a paper, a compiler can do that. But this is actually trying and, and getting your, your hands dirty. One more question for me. Did you mention Valgrind before? Yeah. Was it better, worse, slower, it's more lower. difficult to use? To use? I, it, like the comparison between the two, is it like... Uh, one, right day day? Is, one day you, you sit and then you see there are like six or seven default tools and one of the tools is called Unlucky. And uh, I'm feeling lucky, I guess. And you go with that, and it's uh, intercepting and printing all the loads and stores. And you have a lot already. And then you see how he counts instructions, and it's very easy to start. But, but running Wagwind without any functionality is going to give you four or five acts of, of slowdown. Right. So you pay, you pay like that. And the only thing you see are, are uh, dynamic instrumentation or debug information that was passed in the, the dynamic runtime of the execution and here in, in LLVM you're controlling compile time you're designing what you want to pass into uh, dynamic instrumentation and and maybe you can go go even further back and, and make some compile decisions well, not compile decisions but we are trying to deal with that also yeah but also it had a really high overhead I mean it was 100k gigs right or buggy so an execution of one minute would take uh, one Minutes. So I think now we are so, so, so we are and, and yeah we are maintaining both versions and I think that LLVM we get it but LLVM the part we have in LLVM is, is way more optimized mm -hmm. and it is about hundred times like two orders of magnitude faster and especially what, what was important for us is to say so we are going to do some very heavy instrumentation so so we wanna pass some part of execution, maybe half of the execution, more or less without any instrumentation. And that you can do with compiler, because you say, this thing I compiled without any instrumentation. With Wargant, you cannot do that. Every time you have this uh, hook that you injected for instrumenting something, and you want you need to say dynamically, well, there's a hook, but I don't get it. Yeah.
Engels. Don't be afraid. Come on. If there's more questions, now we can go have a beer over there. Maybe okay. people can ask, and they will yeah. be so shy. And, uh, we are okay. friendly, friendly when the camera is off. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. Thank <laughs> you.